today as we come to the table. If you take away the literal interpretation of Scripture, that means the person interpreting is now the authority. When you decide, well, I know the Bible says that, but let me tell you what it really means. That means God's no longer the authority, now I'm the authority. And guys, that scares me to death. I will never be the authority. God is the authority, and God's Word is the authority. And unless we simply believe what He says, anybody can interpret it the way they want, confuse the body of Christ, and they become the authority. No, we're gonna believe it literally, in context, with all the symbols and imagery involved to what the literal meaning is. The things we don't understand, well, we don't understand. The things we do understand, we're gonna stand on. What do you build your belief system on? Is it on what God says is true or on what you want to believe is true? So often many people try to interpret the Bible through their own belief system instead of building their belief system on what God says through the Bible. Don't fall into the trap of making the Bible say what you want. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville. In his message today, Pastor Mark will challenge you to build your truth on God's authority. It's important to understand the context and the meaning of the original language in the Bible, but don't let that dilute the literal application. God's word has stood the test of time. You can believe in it and build your life upon it. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Romans chapter 11 as he begins his message, why Christians Should Stand with Israel. We come today now to our fourth and last in the series of Why the Christians Should Stand with the Nation of Israel. I'm not a series pastor, you guys know that. We go line by line, verse by verse, but I felt the need specifically to do this uh, because of all that's happening in the world. So uh, we're going to be ending today in Ezekiel, but I want you to start in Romans chapter 11. Turn to Romans chapter 11, and as you guys are turning to Romans 11, let's pray and ask God to bless our time together. So Lord, we thank you again for this morning. We thank you, God, for the blessing that we get to be a part of in giving to the nation of Israel. God, we say with David, we really have nothing to give. Even what you gave to us to give to Israel came from you. But Lord, you're looking for reasons to bless us. So you gave us some resources and allowed us to pass that on to your chosen people and your future family. And for that, Lord, we thank you for letting us be a part. We pray it would be used, God, for your glory and to show them that they are loved, not just by you, but by your family. And so continue to protect Israel, God, watch over them and protect those soldiers as they go into battle. And uh, again, show yourself strong on behalf of the nation of Israel. But God, I pray now this morning, you'd open up your word to us. You'd show yourself strong on behalf of us. God, open your word. Teach us, God. Again, further drive into our heart why we as believers should stand with the nation of Israel. Um, and Lord, to be able to know that from your word so that we can share it with others uh, and also encourage them as well. So Father, pour out your spirit, be our teacher today by your spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, as we get into this, I wanna encourage you again, if you haven't heard all of these, be sure and go back to the beginning. Uh, you may not understand what we're talking about unless you get the full foundation, and I, I would encourage you to go back and do that. But again, before we jump into this, there's something I want to address, and it really was part of the reason I wanted to address here uh, Romans chapter 11 before we went on into Ezekiel 39, because the Bible says in the last days there's going to be deception entering the church. The Bible says that deceivers and deceit will grow stronger and stronger. There'll be doctrines of demons coming in. And what that means is, is that there's been 2,000 years of steady doctrine that God has established for the church. And something's gonna change at the very end. All of a sudden, they're gonna start questioning things, such as questioning God's word, questioning what's in God's word. He warned us this would happen. We need to be aware that it's happening, and I want to protect you guys from falling victim to being pulled into these false teachings. So what do I mean by that? Again, remember, look, if the church has been established and doing well for 2,000 years, for new things to come along to question that, what has changed, okay? 
What changed is the last day's deception. And I want you to be able to recognize that because they're hearing things such as, well, for example, what is true Israel? We're going to talk about that today. It's basically the Jew. And we'll talk about that today. I'm hearing things, well, God's done with the nation of Israel and there's only a remnant today. That is true. We're going to see in this passage, I wanted you to see it, where they're getting that. There is only a remnant today, but God says that at the end, he's going to pour his spirit out and by the masses of Jews will be saved and it will go from just a remnant of Jews saved to the masses lost to the masses saved and a remnant lost. So there's going to be a major turnaround in the last days of what's going to happen with the nation of Israel. Um, I'm starting to hear things like, well, the Bible, we found out now that it was changed. People went in and changed it. We can't trust the New Testament. Guys, look, here's the bottom line. If your God is not big enough to write a book and then preserve that book, you've got the wrong God. Um, God is not going to allow mankind to override his power for 2,000 years only to reveal to us just now that guess what? We've had it wrong for 2,000 years. That's not the God of heaven. The Bible says he desires that none perish. He's made a way for man to know truth and for man to come into the kingdom and God's not gonna change that. So when you hear these teachings about, well, the Trinity's not in the Bible, well, just take them to the passage in Luke where Jesus is in the water being baptized that's the son. The father speaks from heaven. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Again, you're going to hear all kinds of challenges to the word of God in the last days. The word's been changed. The Trinity's not true. God's done with Israel. We saw in this study that God said, my promise to Israel is unconditional and it's going to last past the new covenant, it tells us in uh, Jeremiah, until the second coming of Jesus Christ. So trust the word of God. Stand on the word of God. And another warning I'm going to give us is this. You've got to take the word of God literally. Now, if you don't know the Lord or you're a visitor and you're new to this concept, when I say take the Bible literally, I recognize there are symbols in the Bible. There are visions in the Bible. There's imagery used in the Bible. I'm aware of that. But you will find behind every image, every symbol, every vision, there is a literal meaning. And when you look at it in context, the literal meaning is made clear. Now, why do I stress that so much? Because God says what he means and God means what he says. And if you take away the literal interpretation of scripture, that means the person interpreting is now the authority. When you decide, well, I know the Bible says that, but let me tell you what it really means. That means God's no longer the authority. Now I'm the authority. And guys, that scares me to death. I will never be the authority. God is the authority, and God's word is the authority. And unless we simply believe what he says, anybody can interpret it the way they want, confuse the body of Christ, and they become the authority. No, we're going to believe it literally, in context, with all the symbols and imagery involved to what the literal meaning is. The things we don't understand, well, we don't understand. The things we do understand, we're gonna stand on. And believe me, that is where throughout history the church has gone astray. That is where cults have been born as they stop taking the word of God simply for what it said. So when I see all this stuff flying in the last days, some of you guys are gonna be deceived. It breaks my heart. I can't stop it because the Bible said it's gonna happen. There's probably some of you down the road that'll get deceived. I hope not. Because the Bible says it'll happen in the last days. So what is my job? My job is to say, please don't be that person. Don't veer from what you know to be true. Don't veer what has stood the test of time for 2,000 years. Don't listen to new things coming down the block. Don't let people convince you that man changed it. We now have enough records to prove that man didn't change it. Again, there's a whole scientific study that proves man didn't change it. I don't have time to get into today, but for those who want to do their homework, it's there. The bottom line is you have solid ground to stand on. Don't let Satan pull you away in the last days because some are going to be. There will be a falling away. Don't let it be you. Now, I think there's going to be a purifying of the church as well. I think that has begun. We talked about what's happening in Israel right now. God is purifying the nation of Israel because God is allowing these things to happen because God is purifying them. God is to get their heart ready to receive their Messiah. They have rejected their Messiah. God is to break their hearts in order for them to have their eyes open to receive the Lord. It has begun, and they're gonna turn to God in droves. Again, we'll see the finish of that today when we get into these passages. But at the same time, the Bible says in the last days, there's gonna be contractions on the earth like a woman in birth pangs. And what that means is you're going to see these major worldwide contractions. They're going to accomplish a number of things. It's the world saying they're getting ready. We're being ready for the return of Christ, but it's going to be used to purify Israel and get them ready. It's going to be used to purify the church and get them ready. It's going to be used to break the unbeliever and bring them to Christ. The first, I think, major worldwide contraction. Again, there may be others before that. I think what we've seen up until 2020, I think we're probably Braxton Hicks. Those of you ladies that have had babies, you know what that is. That's where your body starts practicing for the contractions, right? You just kind of get, it just starts tightening up and you're like, what's going on? But it's not the real deal. It's just getting your body ready. I think we've been seeing that for 2,000 years from time to time. 
I think in 2020, and there may be some other arguable things that were contractions that were before that, but there were longer gaps between them. 2020, we had the whole thing with COVID and all that that happened. I think that was a worldwide event. And I believe it was a worldwide contraction that God used in many ways to bring a lot of people to him because they were afraid, but God also purified the church. Again, remember what the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling together as is the manner of some, especially as you see the day of the Lord approaching. In other words, the closer we get to the return of the Lord, there's gonna be temptations to quit going to church because it's too dangerous, too scary, right? He said, for those who obey me, there's gonna be a reward. And what do we see? We saw the churches that closed down and they didn't continue having services. Many of them shut their doors and many of them are barely surviving now because I believe God is sending out the ranks. God is purifying the church. He's separating the sheep from the goats. He's saying, who's gonna obey my word and who's not? And those that are gonna forsake the assembly, well, they're not being obedient. Those who say, I'm gonna do it no matter what, it's scary, but I trust your word, God, because you commanded it. God blesses, and now we've seen churches grow and be strengthened because of obedience to the Lord. Well, now we have another one. This whole Israel issue in Hamas. Again, look, guys, here's what you're gonna see. It's still kind of at this moment, the early stages. But I believe you're gonna see some churches standing against Israel in this whole process. God's word makes it very clear. I will bless those who bless Israel. I will curse those who curse Israel. And I think you're gonna see a division once again where the body is purified to a second level in this next contraction where the church is getting purer and purer and purer. The Lord says he's coming for a spotless bride. And you're watching God begin to iron the garments. And the wrinkles are gonna be removed. And what it's gonna do is for those that are in these places where they're not standing in the right place, they're gonna start coming out of there going, whoa, 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 there's something wrong here, we're coming out. And they're gonna look for churches that are standing in the right place. And you're gonna see churches, many of them close. You're gonna see many of them struggle. You're gonna see those that are teaching the truth and standing in the words of God, they're gonna get stronger and stronger and they're gonna grow more and more. It's gonna happen until the Lord comes and takes his bride out of here. So be watching for that, but make sure you understand. Now, with that said, we're not saying that Israel's perfect, that they don't make mistakes. And we're not standing with Israel because they always do everything right and everybody around them is always wrong. That is not why we stand with Israel. If you've been here since the beginning of this series, we stand with Israel because God asked us to. I didn't ask us to, he commanded us to. He said, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Regardless, it is an unconditional promise that God said will go, as we said, all the way through into the new covenant. And so God's gonna bless those who do that. And again, I think you're gonna see that kind of division. You know, the Bible talks about when the Lord returns, he's gonna separate the sheep from the goats. I believe the process has begun. And I think a lot of people who think they're sheep are gonna find out, well, maybe I'm not. And I think a lot of people who are sheep in the wrong place are gonna realize I need to get with people who believe the truth in the Bible. And you're gonna see a lot of separation, a lot of division, falling away, deception. So how do we stay on the right path, Mark? You're talking about all these path of deception this way, path of false teaching that way. If you stick to the word of God, the Bible says God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And let me tell you something, you're not gonna veer. You're gonna stay on the right path. You're gonna be brokenhearted when you see other believers veering down the right. Why are you going? Well, because maybe this is the right path. What do you mean maybe it's the right path? Why don't you stay in the one that's been proven for thousands of years? Why don't you stay in the one that's in the word of God? Where are you going? And so it breaks my heart. Uh, But again, I can't stop it, but I can prevent some of it. And I can speak boldly to you guys about it. So you're prepared and ready. And, um, And now we can get into the word. But that's on my heart. And that really led me to where I am looking at Romans 11 because people are saying that God's through with Israel and there's only a remnant and they're done or whatever. No, God's gonna make it clear right here. He's not only not through, there's gonna be way more than a remnant. The nation is gonna come to Christ. Let's jump into Romans chapter 11, verse one. Notice the context here, chapters 9, 10, and 11, is talking about um, the nation of Israel and God's faithfulness to the nation of Israel. So that's the context, okay? And notice what he says, Paul, I say then... Has God cast away his people, that is the nation of Israel? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham. In other words, just because they don't believe right now, God hadn't gotten rid of them. I too am a seed of Abraham and I'm saved. Of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant. Now, this is where they get that, where people say, God's done with Israel and there's only a remnant. There is a remnant. But now watch this. We're gonna see it's gonna totally reverse to where the remnant is gonna be the majority. He says, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, 
but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So the remnant's there, the rest of the nation is blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and bow down their back always. Now, again, his point is, why are they blinded? Why did God allow the Jews to be blind today? The reason God allowed them to be blind is because they rejected their Messiah. And he says, if you're gonna do that, if you, he said, if you'd only known this your day, that would have been for your salvation. But now you've rejected, you're gonna have 2,000 years of consequence because of what you've done. So you're gonna be blinded. But I'm gonna keep a remnant. Some will be saved, but the rest are gonna be blinded. Blindness is there until... The fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews. The church, if you will. Now, again, I know there are Jews that are in the church, etc. But the bottom line is, for the most part, it's us, the Gentiles. In other words, what he's saying is, there is a final Gentile that needs to be saved. When all the Gentiles, the last one, finally comes in, gives his life to the Lord, then the rapture of the church can take place, and this final seven years can happen with Israel. See, God promised them 490 prophetic years in the book of Daniel. They've only used up 483 because it tells us that when the Messiah died, everything went on hold. And this is what we call the church age, the mystery of the church age. So God owes the nation of Israel, by his word prophetically, a final seven years prophetically. And it hadn't started yet. Now, when's it gonna start? It's gonna start when the Antichrist comes on the scene and there'll be a final seven years. I believe the church will be gone and God moves it from the church over to Israel and God's work or whatever. But what is the mystery of the church age and what is the church age? It's until the last Gentile comes in, like he's saying right here. What that means is, theoretically, there's going to be one last person who doesn't know Christ that's going to get saved, and then we're going to be out of here. If you don't know the Lord, we're waiting on you. You're holding this whole thing up. Now, I say that tongue-in-cheek, although technically it's probably accurate. Somebody's going to be the last one to receive, and we're going to go, right? But the reality is, whether you're the last one or not, what's keeping you from coming to the Lord? You see what's happening in the world today. You see what's happening in the Bible. Why are you here today? Now, why would a pastor say that? Why did you come? Well, you don't know the Lord. Why would, you, why would this even concern you? know why you're here? Because the Holy Spirit brought you here. And he like, no, my friend invited me. Well, who do you think moved your friend to invite you? And sometimes people come and nobody even invites them. Like me, I would show up with a hangover and nobody invited me. Seriously, back when I was, before I knew the Lord, I would just, I gotta go to church. I'm like, what am I doing here? I hated the, what the pastor, I didn't agree with anything he said. I'd get upset by the end of the teaching, right? But I still went back the next week. You know why? The Bible says the Holy Spirit goes, I'm gonna bring you in. I'm gonna bring you in. And the Holy Spirit draws you in. Some of you are here today and you think maybe you were invited or you don't know why you came. God is saying, I brought you here today so you can finally make your decision. What are you waiting on? The Lord loves you. If he's opened your eyes and you know it's true, receive him as Lord. Get ready because you don't wanna be here when this mess really unfolds. You know, I've said this before and I'll say it again in this series and that is this. Right now, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is restraining evil in the world until the church is gone. If this is restrained evil, what's it going to look like when he goes, okay, go ahead, Satan. I'm like, Lord, thank you for your restraining power. And I don't want to be here when you lift that restraint. If you don't know the Lord, you're going to be here when that happens. I don't say that as a scare tactic. I know that God can use fear to bring some in the kingdom. That's not my heart. My heart is to reason with you and say, don't wait. Now's the time. But either way, he says here, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And notice what he says. And then all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them And when I take away their sins. Now, we know that there are going to be some that don't give their life to the Lord. Paul says in another place in Romans, I realize that just because somebody says they're of Israel doesn't mean they are. They have to give their life to the Lord. What he's saying is the majority of the nation is going to receive Christ. So right now, you've got just a remnant, the majority rejecting. When this happens, what we're going to see in chapter 39 today of Ezekiel, it's going to be the majority of Jews saved and a remnant that's unsaved. And that's going to be the turnover and the transition that's going to take place. So don't let anybody tell you that it's just a remnant or there's not real Israel. Who is true Israel? It's called the Jew. True Israel is the Jew. And God will sort out the details uh, when he pours out his spirit. Now, with that said, let's jump now from, again, why we back Israel and God's not done with Israel into chapter 39. You know, I love the way the prophet wrote this and how God wrote it because it applied to that day and today. And what do I mean? In the language here, he talks about bows and arrows, which they would have understood. But remember, he's seeing a vision. Ezekiel's seeing a vision of the future. He's describing it, how God told him to describe it. But as soon as you hear the word bow means launcher and arrow means missile. So what that means is the same thing for bow and arrow in that day is the same language today that's used in modern warfare. So it applies beautifully. 
He says, I will knock the launcher out of your left hand, the missile out of your right hand, the bow and arrow. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to birds of prey, to every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. That is when you all die in battle, I'm gonna use the birds and the animals to clean up the mess. They're gonna come in and help to do this. We'll see more detail about how he's gonna clean it up later. Notice this, you shall fall on an open field for I have spoken, says the Lord. I love the authority. God says more than once, you know, it's me, I've spoken, it's gonna happen and it's gonna take place. And by the way, if God has been 100% accurate, you've heard me say this a lot, if he's been 100% accurate up to this point, what makes us think he wouldn't be 100% accurate from this point on? He's gonna finish when he started, guys. God's word can't fail. His word failing means somehow his reputation is eternally smeared. He will not allow that to happen. As a matter of fact, the reason he said he's defending Israel is not because of them. Said, I'm not defending you because you were good. He said, as a matter of fact, you were horrible. He said, I'm defending you from my name. You've smeared my name. My name cannot be smeared eternally. It may be smeared temporarily, but I'm true to my promises. I'm true to my name, and the whole world's gonna know it. He's gonna reiterate that more than once here. Verse six, and I'll send fire on Magog and on those who live in security in the coastlands. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, I want you to know there are some uh, scholars that believe and some Bible teachers or whatever, and I used to look at this a strong possibility that this could be some type of nuclear exchange because of fire, and some even said the coastlands, it could maybe include other places like America, whatever. I don't think that's what this is saying. I've come to a place now where I think this is specifically speaking just about the nation of Israel, and the reason I don't believe there's gonna be any nuclear activity going on in this battle, I don't believe there is, because as I've said, God continues all through 38 and 39. He makes a point to say, it's gonna be me that gets the glory. Everybody's gonna know that I did it from heaven. And any type of nuclear weapon or military campaign that defeats it is gonna get credit to whoever did the military campaign. If somebody fires a missile, wow, they stopped the forces of Russia. No, I think God's gonna do it supernaturally. And we talked about a possible theory of that with those volcanoes up there uh, last week. And again, it's interesting. We talked about the coastlands. Those volcanoes, they blast a rock all the way over to the Mediterranean. So that would be fire to the coastlands. It fits the definition as well. Time will tell what it is, but either way, then they'll know that I'm the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my name anymore. So that's for 2,000 years they've been profaning it. They've rejected the Messiah. People mock them. Oh, look at the God of Israel. Look how faithful he was to you guys, right? He said, nope, I'm not gonna let that happen anymore. And look at this. Then the nations, that's everybody else on the earth, shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. That is, again, it's gonna be done in such a way that I'm gonna get the credit. Not Israel, not America, not their aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean. It's gonna be me that gets the credit. Nobody else that's gonna get this. So again, supernatural. And look at the confidence he says again. Surely it is coming and it shall be done. Amen, I love it. Says the Lord, this is the day of which I have spoken. So again, take it to the bank. It's gotta happen and it will. And again, remember this, we know historically this battle has never taken place. There's no battle in history that matches this battle. And again, it's not the battle of Armageddon, which we talked about last week. There are too many differences, which again, if you want to line up all the things that happened in Armageddon here, you'll clearly see this is two different battles. Thanks for joining us today on Come to the Table with Pastor Mark Kirk. Pastor Mark is teaching a short series titled why Christians should stand with Israel. As you know from current events, Israel is facing yet another assault from enemy countries. This seems to be a pattern in history, unfortunately. Israel has been and continues to be God's chosen nation and people. And it's no surprise that the enemy wants to attack from any direction. We hope that what you've heard today in Pastor Mark's message has sparked interest, concern, and would prompt you to pray for the nation of Israel. Thanks for tuning in today. We'd like to invite you to come visit us in person. If you're in the Knoxville area, we'd love for you to come to Calvary Knoxville this Sunday. Our services are Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 9.30 and 11.15 a.m. and a midweek service every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Bring the whole family. Every time we gather, it's an opportunity to grow in learning and experiencing God more fully. If you're interested and would like more info, click on the church link at the bottom of the page at thewaymedia.net. You can also use the questions and comments link to get more info. If you'd like to listen to any of these teachings again, just click on the Come to the Table link online or connect with the Way Media app. 
For any questions or concerns, you can reach us at 865-609-1385. That number again is 865-609-1385. That's all we have for today. But thanks for listening to Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.